it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. The Clan of the Red Wolf. I'm a student of Bridgewater State in Massachusetts. I share a dorm with my roommate, Wallace. We both major in computer science, and, and that's all we've ever talked about on the rare occasions that we actually speak to one another. We don't have much else in the way of common ground. You see, um, Wallace is an odd guy. He's very socially awkward and doesn't have many friends, if any at all. I've only ever seen him talking to his professors, and one time the janitor. Uh, it's safe to say that Wallace is a recluse. Because of this, I don't know much about him. I'd love for the guy to open up more, but I'm not sure how to go about doing that. Besides, I have enough on my plate, as it is between exams and the uh, struggle of day-to-day -day finances. Well, as cliche as it might sound, ramen is a popular meal on campus. Another one of Wallace's quirks is his obsessive-compulsive nature. He conducts himself in a very specific manner and has his daily routine mapped out to a T. It never changes. When he wakes up, he brushes his teeth, making sure to gargle and spit exactly three times. He then puts on a striped shirt followed by khaki pants, and his wardrobe never changes. He always arrives to class five minutes early and turns in his assignments a day before they're due, and this is how it's always been. And how do I know all of this? Well, being a socially awkward hermit, Wallet didn't tell me these things. I don't think he's even aware that his routine is a byproduct of OCD. I'm not claiming to know exactly what causes Wallace's actions, but I do minor in psychology. It's just something I've picked up on during the last two years I've lived with the guy. Well, it's almost impossible not to notice. Knowing Wallace's usual behavioural patterns, I noticed that something wasn't right. He began sleeping in his clothes, not brushing his teeth and not passing in his assignments on time. Eventually he stopped sleeping in our dorm altogether. After over a day of not seeing him, things started looking grim. Despite not knowing Wallace all that well, I became worried. Depression and suicide rates are an all-time high for our age group. I didn't want the poor guy doing something stupid. That worry justified me hacking into his laptop to see what he'd been up to. It was the only thing I could think to do. In finding his laptop and turning it on, I felt like a fool. The thing was as clean as a whistle, at least to my eyes. You see, though I pride myself in my tech know-how, Wallace is far more adept in the field. It was safe to say that I wouldn't find a shred of evidence as to where he might be or what he'd been doing. No journal entries, no browsing history, no nothing. Feeling anxious, I thought about any other potential ways to continue my hunt for the truth. That's when something clicked. Like I said before, I sometimes saw Wallace talking to the janitor in the halls. He was the only person I'd ever seen him speak with at length. It was possible that he'd know something about Wallace's state of affairs. Later that night, I exited my dorm and wandered the halls. Eventually I found Chuck, the janitor. I tried to be gentle when confronting him, as he had his back to me and was known to be hard of hearing. Still, when I uh, tapped on his shoulder... He jumped. Holy cheeseballs, you nearly scared me half to death. Chuck laughed through his bushy grey moustache. What can I do for you, son? I told Chuck about my predicament and how I was concerned for Wallace, having not seen him in a while. Chuck's happy expression transformed into a look of unease and tension. He seemed to know a bit more than I did. Well, here's the thing. Wallace is a good kid. We do chat from time to time. I happen to know where he might be, but I wouldn't feel comfortable blurting out the details of his social life to anyone who asked, even if you are his roommate. Social life? Wallace didn't have a social life. I pressured Chuck into letting me in on the secret. I really laid it on thick, expressing a great deal of concern for Wallace's well-being. Being the nice old janitor that Chuck is... He eventually gave in. Okay, okay, I understand. Just please don't tell him I told you, okay? I nodded, eagerly awaiting for him to reveal Wallace's whereabouts. 
Wallace has been feeling really down lately. He's got no one to talk to but me. Get wanted some friends. People that he could hang out with and talk to, you know. I listened closely for the details I so desperately sought after. So, um, Wallace went on something he called, what was it, uh, the Deep Web. And on there he found a group of people. Called themselves the Clan of the Red Wolf or something like that. Invited him to one of their meetings. That's probably where he is right now. He seemed pretty excited when he told me about it. In fact, it's all he's been talking about for the past week. There. That was it. That was the bit of info I needed. The key to finding Wallace. I thanked Chuck and gave him a good night wave as I ran back to my dorm room. From the sounds of it, Wallace had got himself involved with another group of people who share in his interests and eventually they invited him to hang out in real life. Well, they had a quirky name, the Clan of the Red Wolf, and that's all I needed to find them on the deep web myself. Soon enough, I'd be able to find my missing roommate. Well, it took quite a while, but I finally managed to find a deep web forum pertaining to the so-called clan. It contained nothing but a description and a series of videos. Here's the description as it appeared on the site. Welcome to your new belief system. We are the clan of the Red Wolf, and we are here to help. There are seven educational videos on this site each tailored to a specific belief that we want to share with you. You are asked to watch these seven programs to understand our doctrine. If you make it to the last one, you will be invited into our den. Good luck. Well, the summary was bizarre, but nothing less than what I'd expected. Scrolling further, I noticed that all of the videos were titled similarly. Day one, day two, and so on. Naturally, I watched them. The whole series reminded me of old war propaganda. It was made in the style of a vintage cartoon, starring a wolf as the main focus. Well, not a normal wolf, but a cartoon caricature version of one. Just, well, um, picture a character similar to Wile E. Coyote. In each video, the wolf learned a new clan value from the campy male narrator. Not unlike old cartoons, the wolf comically goes against the narrator's wishes and suffers the consequences before learning his lesson. Every video ends with a narrator saying, Join the pack. You never have to feel alone again. I guess that was what the selling point was for Lonely Wallace. Now I'll share with you a bit of the transcript from each video, along with any points of interest. Video 1. Wildlife. Treat flora and fauna with dignity and respect. They're people too. Trees provide you with the air you breathe and animals share the earth with you, keeping you from being alone. They deserve more than you ever will. The wolf relieves himself on a tree. The tree falls on top of him, crushing his head and revealing the blood and brain matter inside. Video 2. Thicker than blood. Your blood is the most important material in your earthly vessel. The clan requires a sample upon joining our order. This is a requirement for all pledges. Our blood must flow as one for us to work together and save the planet. The wolf enters a room full of cloak figures, presumably clan members. All members are in line, giving blood samples. The wolf refuses to have his blood drawn and walks away. The cloak figure sneaks up on him and slices his throat with a dagger. The video focuses on the wolf bleeding out for a few moments before fading to black. Video 3. Obey or suffer. Remember what happened to our friend when he didn't give his blood to the cause. He didn't obey our order's rules, so he had to suffer the consequences. Remember, the clan's laws are important. You must obey or perish. Trust me, it's worth it. Shows the wolf bleeding out again. Only now a few cloaked figures are on top of him stabbing his corpse repeatedly. Video 4. Vow of Secrecy The clan of the Red Wolf is often misunderstood. Because of this, it is important to never tell anyone of our existence under any circumstances. You may only speak about clan activity with other clan members. Break this rule and you will perish. 
Wolf is shown talking to his wolf pals and showing them his new cloak. A cloak figure walks in frame with what looks like a semi-automatic weapon and opens fire. The wolves fall to the ground, dead. The cloak figure gives a thumbs up before the video ends. Video 5. Learn and understand. If you're welcomed into our inner sanctum, you will be greeted with knowledge. We abide by the word of the Red Wolf, and you will too. You will be expected to learn and understand his teachings, otherwise you will fail. Not only the clan, but the entire world. Wolf is seen in a classroom environment, taking a test of some sort. He turns it into a cloak teacher and receives an F. The entire class points and laughs at him, and then pulls out a plethora of medieval weaponry from their robes. They then proceed to close in on the wolf. The wolf swallows the lump in his throat before the video ends. Video 6. Tasks and Rituals. As a new recruit, you will be asked to carry out various tasks, ranging from the mundane to the fantastic. Most of these missions will involve fetching ingredients for our rituals. As boring as this may sound, it is the most important thing you can ever do for the clan. Rituals are what give the clan power. Without this power, we cannot hope to rid the world of what plagues it. Wolf fails to bring ingredients to clan member for ritual. Jump! cut to Wolf being sacrificed on a black altar atop a pentagram carved into the floor. He is beaten, cut open, and eventually torn apart by his fellow clansmen. Video 7 Mortals When accepted as a fully-fledged clan member, you are no longer considered human. You will be one of us. From that point forward, you are discouraged from any and all human interaction, unless it is deemed necessary to the cause. Humans are vile, filthy, disgusting, and dangerous creatures. We seek to exterminate them once and for all. Any human who knows of our existence and isn't deemed worthy enough to join must be killed. Nature is your only friend. Wolf is walking down a main street-like environment and can be seen waving to people he sees. He comes upon a clan member who then pierces his gut with a long blade and tosses him aside in the road where he's then run over by numerous cars. Oh, the content of the videos was incredibly jarring. I almost couldn't believe that such a cult would actually exist, let alone that Wallace would join them. He must have been really, really lonely. The last video exited with the same Join the Pack spiel, and then faded out to a screen with a series of numbers. I assume this was my invitation into the den, Perhaps an encrypted set of coordinates leading to the clan's lair. That, I thought, must have been where Wallace had gone. I wrote down the code and immediately started doing some research to begin cracking it. Just as I was in the thick of things, something hit me. One of the videos stated that you couldn't talk to anyone about the clan under any circumstances. But Wallace had talked to Chuck. That didn't make any sense. Wallace was a stickler for rules. Another fact hit me. The video stated that you could only talk about clan activity with another clan member. What if Chuck was one of them? Chuck could be stationed at the college to recruit members and he simply nudged Wallace in the right direction. He could have been playing dumb with me when I questioned him. So, either Chuck was a clansman or Wallace broke a cardinal rule. Neither theory held much water. If Chuck was a member, then why would he have told me anything without either recruiting or killing me? And if Wallace was so eager to be accepted into a strict cult, then why would he disobey their wishes? I couldn't make much sense of either angle. I eventually gave in to the notion that perhaps Wallace simply disregarded the rules in lieu of his excitement. He was finally going to have friends, so he had to tell someone. This didn't completely sit well with me, but I had to get back to cracking the code. I didn't have time to dwell on uncertainties. Just then, there was a knock at my dorm room door, followed by a voice. It's uh, Chuck, the janitor. Yeah, I'm here to tidy up your room. Chuck never cleaned dorm rooms. That wasn't part of his job. Oh, um, I'm all set, I yelled, hoping he'd leave me be. 
the knocking ceased. There was a long stretch of silence followed by a soft, metallic creak. The doorknob was turning. The monster in the pantry. Unexplained phenomena are a staple in human culture. Strange goings on, paranormal in nature, are prominent in our lives in one form or another. You may not think about them all that often. There's always a piece in the news or a crazy story from a friend or passerby that makes you recall such strangeness. No matter how many times you forget about the subject, there'll always be a moment that drags the notion back to the surface of your memory. For several years I'd forgotten all about the monster living in my mum's pantry. I'd forgotten all about it. That is, until now. I was ten years old when I first became aware of the monster's presence. It was a normal evening at home. My mother and I waited for my father's arrival and I helped her out with dinner preparations. I look back on these memories fondly. I loved cooking with my mum and was overjoyed whenever my father came home from work. I had what some would consider a picture-perfect childhood, save for one peculiarity. The thing that resided in the pantry would audibly reveal itself that very night. While cutting up vegetables for my mum's famous beef barley soup, I heard a scratching at the pantry door. Startled, I jumped, nearly cutting off one of my fingers in the process. My mum looked over at the pantry, then to me with a concerned smile. I looked to her for answers, utterly baffled by the noise. There it goes again, scratching at the pantry door. What is it, Mom? I asked. I'm not too sure, sweetie, but it's been here ever since we moved in. Sometimes it scratches at the door, other times it'll knock food off the pantry shelves. Some nights it doesn't make a sound at all. There was no comfort derived from her explanation. I was still frightened, and my mother noticed it. It's nothing to be scared of, honey. Is it something... bad? I asked. No, of course not. Just then, the scratching recommenced. I jumped a second time. My mother then walked over to the pantry door. Here, look. She opened it up as the scratching continued. Once the door was completely ajar, the sound ceased. See, sweetie? There's nothing to be worried about. Despite my mother's comforting words, my ten-year-old heart couldn't help but race with fear. In the coming years, I continued to help her cook, but I never once set foot back in that pantry, convinced that the thing living in there was a monster out to get me. This fear was kept alive by the scratching that would interrupt otherwise happy moments. I ignored it the best I could, but sometimes I would have to leave the kitchen. Eventually... The sound stopped altogether. It's now been many years since then, and both my parents have passed away. In their wills, I was left everything, including my childhood home. It took me a while to come to terms with their deaths and move back in, but I eventually accepted the situation and embraced the living space where I had grown up. It was the little memories sprinkled throughout the house that helped me cope. Sometimes I'd walk into the living room and see my dad sitting in his chair, smoking a cigar and watching his favourite sitcom. At other points, I'd see my mother in the kitchen, making us dinner. These corporeal fragments of a time long since past kept me going. After a while, the house felt like home again. Until one day. I'd just arrived home from work when it happened. I sat down on my dad's favourite chair and flipped on the TV to unwind. Something crossed my mind. Minus the tobacco, I'd actually become my father. This thought put a bit of a smile on my face as I reclined in the chair to relax. Relaxation never came, though, as an all-too-familiar scratching sound emanated from the nearby pantry. My smile quickly vanished. I jumped up and ran to the kitchen to investigate. The scratching sound continued and increased in volume. I stared at the door, hoping an answer would jump out at me, but also hoping whatever was inside wouldn't do the same. Without many options at my disposal, I was forced to open it. Much to my anticipation, 
The noise ceased, and I found nothing behind the door but some empty shelves and an old broom. This was the same thing that happened when my mother opened the door many years ago. I was no longer a frightened child, but the sound's return was still unnerving. At least, it was at first. After a while, it became nothing more than a bothersome fixture in my otherwise normal days. Whenever I came home from work, woke up in the middle of the night, or sat down to watch television, that terrible scratching would invade my ear space, not stopping until I'd opened that damn pantry door. This routine continued for over a year. One night, however, everything changed. I'd just gotten home from a long day of work and flung myself into the comfort of my bed sheets. Oh, I wanted nothing more than to drift off into a peaceful slumber, hoping the day's troubles would melt away in the form of happy dreams and restful sleep. Unfortunately for me, the moment my head hit the pillow, the scratching started up once more. I groaned in anger, not wanting to leave my bed for anything, much less that damned noise. Because of this, I made the mistake of not getting up right away. I hit my internal snooze button and allowed myself to drift off for a few moments. When I came to, something was amiss. I didn't notice it at first. But the unsettling silence made way for a startling revelation. The scratching had stopped. Hmm, how strange. It's never stopped on its own before. Perplexed, I jumped out of bed and ventured downstairs to investigate. What I saw upon entering the kitchen alarmed me. The pantry door was wide open. That can't be. It was definitely closed when I got home earlier. Turning the light on only revealed the usual empty shelves. It wasn't until my hand met the wood of the door that I noticed something unusual. Embedded in the hard oak were deep gashes, claw marks that covered the entire bottom half of the door. Those weren't there before. What the hell is going on? My childhood was beginning to catch up with me. Memories of the pantry came bursting through the floodgates, the scratches, the nightmares the fear. But I wasn't a child this time. I wasn't going to let a little superstition get the better of me. It was just a raccoon or a large rat, that's all. At least, that's what I told myself. I scoured the house for nearly an hour, ignoring my fast-beating heart the whole time. Whatever had escaped from the pantry was nowhere to be found. I stepped back into the kitchen to close the door and call it a night. Something stopped me in my tracks. A shadowy figure raced across my field of vision and into the pantry. Crack. The pantry door shut on its own, shaking the walls around it. A bone-chilling vibration reverberated throughout the entire house in an instant and was then followed by an eerily dead silence. My heart sank to my bowels. I was officially rattled. Running on pure instinct, I grabbed the heaviest things I could find and piled them in front of the door, including my dad's old chair. Once satisfied with my blockade, I raced upstairs, locked my bedroom door and jumped underneath the sheets. I was a kid again, scared shitless of the monster living in my mom's pantry. After the fear and adrenaline had tapered off, I managed to get a little bit of rest. My late night adventure come to an end. I woke up the next morning in denial, a defense mechanism of a mind bruised by fear. Pretending nothing had happened the previous night, I went about my morning routine as normal. After breakfast, I was able to walk right past the pile of crap in front of the pantry without even flinching. I even ignored the scratch marks on my front door as I left for work. Everything was fine. There was no monster, no supernatural entity taking over my home. That was absurd. It was just a raccoon, a very large raccoon. Well, these lies only lasted for so long. Driving away, the terror set back in, sending me into a desperate frenzy of distress and unease. Though distracted by my strange predicament, I managed to make it to work in one piece. But work brought me no solace. All I could think about was what awaited me at home. I was on edge, and my boss noticed this. 
He asked if I needed to leave early and get some rest. And I practically shouted the word no at him, begging him to let me stay. I wanted to be away from that house for as long as I could. Though confused by my unorthodox behaviour, my boss obliged. I might have been able to stay at work, but I had to clock out eventually. The day went by far too quickly, and before I knew it, I was back home, sitting in my driveway, dreading the thought of opening the front door. Because of this, I sat in my car for a while, attempting to come up with a plan of action. What do I do? Who can I tell? Where will I stay? The question swirled around my tired mind until I shut my eyes and took a deep breath to relax. The weariness caught up with me in this moment, causing me to drift off into a stress-induced coma of sorts. I woke up a few hours later to the terrifying sight of scratch marks on my driver's side window. That was the last straw. <sighs> That's it, I proclaimed out loud. I wasn't going to let this thing control my life, and I certainly wasn't going to let it drive me out of my own home. This is where I grew up, where I spent my childhood with my mother and father. They were still with me, the recollection scattered throughout the house, reminding me of who they were and the impact they'd had on my life. No amount of scratching was going to tear through the memories I had of them. Fed up, I got out of my car, walked up to the house, and swung the front door open. I was greeted with the sound of scratching, and this time it was louder than it had ever been before. As I stormed over to the kitchen, the noise morphed into a thunderous banging at the pantry door, causing the stuff I'd piled in front of it to move a bit. Whatever was inside really wanted to get out this time. Adrenaline coursed through my veins. My fight-or-flight response was begging me to run, but it was too late. I'd already made up my mind. I was going to face this thing head-on and get to the bottom of the mystery. This was my home, after all. It belonged to me and my family, not whatever this thing was. In removing the stack of furniture, the banging continued and grew louder. The kitchen cabinets around me swung open, and various pots and pans fell off the shelf. An earthquake of supernatural proportions filled my home, but I didn't allow it to rattle me. I knew what I had to do. After a moment of mental preparation, I opened the pantry door. There, sitting behind the door, was a dog. It sat there and looked up at me in confusion. I did the same to it. After giving me a once-over, he walked over to me and nuzzled up against my leg. I instinctively reached down to pet it, as I would any dog. But this wasn't any dog. After a few minutes of getting to know each other, it walked back into the pantry and vanished before my very eyes. It was... a ghost. Well, my fear completely dissipated after that day. I now come home to the sound of scratching and smile. I no longer open the pantry door in fear, but instead to let my new friend out. He walks around the house, exploring, just like a normal dog would. He even sits down and watches TV with me from time to time. He is a bit shy, though, vanishing whenever I have company over. Still, he is a good dog. A very good dog. I assume he belonged to one of the many owners of the house, seeing as it had been built long before my parents moved in. I guess he just... Couldn't let the place go. <laughs> Neither could I. A few weeks of bonding later, and I realised I didn't have anything to call him by. I walked over to the little guy and pet him on the back of his neck. That was his favourite spot. I thought about it for a moment, and then came up with a perfect name. I'll call you Monster. The Attic in the Basement Quiet down back there, I yelled whilst driving down an all-too-familiar road. My best friend and his girlfriend wouldn't stop laughing loudly with each other, much like young couples do. I almost regretted bringing them, but I really didn't want to go alone, and inviting one of those two lovebirds meant inviting the pair. They were a package deal. Lucky for me, the torturous sound of laughter would soon cease, as we were approaching our destination. We're here. I stated, 
less to point out her arrival, and more to shut up the two of them. I just wanted some peace and quiet so I could think clearly. I wasn't exactly mentally prepared for what needed to be done. My aunt's old house was just as I remembered it. A rickety old cottage down a dead-end road in the middle of nowhere, complete with woods, wildlife, and the welcoming smell of roses that she often planted near the stone walkway. And that was when it finally hit me. While traversing that very walkway, smelling those very roses, I stopped dead in my tracks, tears welling up in my eyes. Are you okay? My friend's girlfriend asked. Yeah, I'm fine. I just need a second. They looked concerned, but understood. What else would they expect of me coming back to my aunt's house right after she died? Honestly, it felt a little weird. I may have been her favourite nephew, but after leaving me everything in her will, it seemed wrong to go out there so soon. The service was held just a day prior, and I knew everything she had wasn't much, and I knew I wasn't really there to collect my inheritance, but I still felt bad, and at this moment, I felt even worse. Well, the memories I had of her were being dredged up with every step I took towards the front door. I hadn't seen her since I was ten years old, but I could play every memory in my head like a movie. I was very close to her in those days. She might as well have been my mum. My actual mother cared for me, but she wasn't loving in the way that my aunt was. I remember visiting her after school and being greeted with some cliché milk and cookies. Instead of watching television like a normal kid, she didn't own one, I would listen to my aunt play the piano for hours on end. We'd sometimes go bird-watching or walk in the garden. Things that I've not done or even thought of doing since. Oh, these are some of the most treasured memories. And just like treasure, I kept them locked up and hidden away for many years. Until now. As I approached the door to the cottage, I stopped in my tracks once more. Seriously, are you okay? My friend asked this time, seeming very concerned. You'd never seen me like this before. Yeah, I'm fine. Why don't you two take that hike you were talking about? I'll go on in and take a look round. You guys can meet me back at the car later. <laughs> if you say so. And the two of them took off down a trail in the woods, and I was left standing there, looking at the house that I'd not seen in many years. The feeling that overcame me was so strange. It's hard to put into words. It was more than grief, greater than sadness. I guess the best way to say it is that I missed her. It's funny, if she could see me now, she probably wouldn't recognize me. I'm tall, bearded, wear glasses, almost the polar opposite of my appearance as a child. Thinking of this just made me sadder. She'd never get to see the man I'd become. With one last sigh of emotion, I marched on and reached for the handle on the front door. My aunt didn't have locks on her doors or windows. The house was constructed so long ago that it wasn't even built with them. She could have had some installed, but she didn't feel she needed them out in the middle of nowhere. She brought it up one of the first times I stayed there, saying, Trust the world, and it'll set you free. When I was a kid, hearing her say this made me feel safe, somehow. Being fully grown and recalling this statement now, I find it very peculiar. But then again, that was my aunt for you unpretentious and oblivious to the rest of the world around her. Honestly, I miss that part of her the most. All of these memories came back to me piece by piece as I pulled the door open. The bittersweet release I felt was interrupted when I saw the inside of the cottage. Everything, and I mean everything, was exactly in its place. It was like I was a kid again, coming over after school to enjoy my aunt's company. My memories were projected right in front of me like a nostalgic outburst of energy. Oh, I could see my aunt sitting at the piano, playing as she often would. I could see me, sitting there, eating some homemade cookies, listening intently to the music. I could see her again, cooking dinner in the kitchen as I sat on the couch, reading one of her old books. I walked past these living recollections and went upstairs to see more. I stopped quickly when I reached the top of the staircase. I realised that it only led to the attic. I had no interest in it, remembering that my aunt used it for storage, so I travelled back downstairs. I don't know what I was looking for exactly, maybe just a little peace of mind to put my heart at ease. 
Maybe just something that would let me know without any doubt that my aunt passed away peacefully. In truth, I felt an immense amount of guilt being in that house again, almost too much to bear. When I was just shy of eleven years old, my parents moved out of state. And this is when I stopped seeing my aunt. We kind of lost touch, especially seeing as she didn't have any real means of communication out there. No phone, no computer. She didn't even have a mailbox, and the nearest post office was over twenty miles away. Being older now, I could have easily paid her a visit, and I'm sure she would have loved to have seen me. I guess I just thought she'd always be there. Unfortunately, she had a heart attack, and with no hospital or neighbours for miles, death came knocking on her unlocked door in a hasty fashion. At the very least, this visit put the fleeting quality of life into perspective for me. At this point, I figured it was the only thing I'd end up taking away from the place. As I made my way down the stairs and back into the living room, I noticed something. I was in such a hurry to escape my corporeal memories that I didn't notice it before. It was a desk. The desk where my aunt would sit and write for hours at a time. She said that it helped her experience the world outside of her cottage, by writing about how she imagined and wanted it to be. The more I remembered my aunt, the more I could see how isolated and somewhat unstable she really was. And she was odd, but I loved her just the same, even now. What I hadn't noticed upon entering the house was that the desk drawer was open. I looked inside and found a single sheet of paper with my aunt's handwriting on it. This is what it said. To my dearest nephew, if you're reading this, then the cold ties of death have swept me away once and for all. I know that we've not seen each other since you were a child, but, but I hope you still think fondly back on our time together. I was happy to look after you, and I know that you were happy to spend time with me. I don't want you to be sad or feel off-put about my death in any way. This is how it is, and in turn, how it was meant to be. I'll always hold you dear in my heart. And I hope you'll do the same for me. I want you to live freely despite this and enjoy each and every moment of your life just as I did mine. I'll see you again someday and I look forward to it. Trust the world and it will set you free. I shed a tear reading this passage, knowing that my aunt wanted me to find peace in this old house. The very closure I was looking for was in her desk the whole time. The elation I felt almost distracted me from the postscript at the bottom of the page. P.S. Don't go in the basement. How peculiar. What was down there? Was my aunt hiding something? If so, what was it? Curious as ever, I walked over to the basement door with the letter in hand, knowing that the answers were down there. I took one last look at the warning. Don't go in the basement. It was most likely the ramblings of an unstable old woman on the verge of death. But what could be the real meaning behind it? Why the basement? Why me? I could recall the basement from when I was younger, but I didn't remember much. I'd only been down there once. My aunt was outside gardening while I was inside reading one of her books. Well, I grew tired of reading and set the book down on her desk. Soon after, I began wandering around the house out of boredom. I walked around the entire cottage rather quickly. Eventually I came upon the basement, somewhere I'd never played before. Knowing my aunt wouldn't be in for a while, I decided to venture on. I turned the knob and swung the door open. I could only see the top of the stairs descending down into the darkness. Despite the bit of fear rattling in my chest, I pressed on. Once down there, my field of vision was filled with pitch blackness. This caused me to scramble about, looking for a light switch. After a few moments, I bumped into a string, dangling from the ceiling in the middle of the room. Upon pulling it, the room lit up, however dimly. What I saw disappointed me. It was a typical basement, but smaller, with concrete walls, a concrete floor, and some pieces of wood sitting off in the corner. And probably some old floorboards left over from the house's construction. When you're a kid, there's a bit of mystery and adventure injected into everything you do. This adventure ended on a flat note, leading me to an unused space, lost to the depths of the house. The thing that I remember was my aunt's voice as she came down the stairs yelling, 
You can't be down there. She sounded more worried than angry, probably scared I'd somehow hurt myself down there. There was more to this memory, but that was all I could recall while standing in front of the basement door. I turned the knob and swung the door open, revealing only the top of the stairs and the basement below, completely void of light. Instead of feeling adventurous like I did as a child, I now felt nervous, repeating the words my aunt had left me over and over in my head, and then asking myself once more, Why? I crept down the stairs slowly, so as not to shake the foundation. That's what I told myself, but I guess my sluggish pace was largely on account of the fact that I was frightened at what I might find when I reached the bottom. Growing impatient and uncomfortably anxious, I picked up the pace a bit. I felt the concrete below my feet, and I rapidly darted towards the centre of the roof. Reaching for the light, praying that it still worked, I felt around for the string and then pulled it. To my delight, it still harboured electricity. The room became dimly lit. In a panicky state, I spun around, looking every which way as I did. And what I saw surprised me. There was nothing there. It was just how I left it when I was a kid. Even the old floorboards were there, still untouched. I felt relieved, but far more confused than before. Why didn't my aunt want me to go down there? I pondered for a bit and figured that maybe there was asbestos or mould in the cellar walls. Well, this would explain why she didn't want me playing in there as a kid, and why she didn't want me there as an adult either. Well, she just wanted to keep me safe, like she always did. This made me feel better, but deep down I knew there was more behind my aunt's plea. As I made my way over to the stairs, something gave me pause. Memories were coming back to me. I could recall being in the basement when I was younger, but there was something different about it. Different than how it looked now. There was a door. A door that led straight to the attic. How could I have forgotten? It was all so clear to me now. I remember finding a door down there and entering the attic. I knew it was the attic because I peered out of the window and saw my aunt gardening two stories below. I waved to her, but she was too busy to notice me. I found it odd at the time that I was able to travel directly from the basement to the attic without so much as climbing a single step. But I brushed it off. I mean, after all, I was only ten, and I had no interest in getting caught up in the semantics of how a house was built. But being older, this strange memory was perplexing. How could the basement lead to the attic? It isn't even remotely possible. I tried to call on some more memories, but the details of that day were still fuzzy. I tried convincing myself that it was a dream I was recalling. How could it have been anything else? It was nonsense, right? There's no way it really happened. I was somewhat comfortable with this hypothesis. I continued to the stairs, but not before giving the basement another once-over. What I saw eliminated all doubt from my mind. There, in the middle of the far left wall of the basement, was the door from my memory. I squinted and rubbed my eyes, keeping them closed for a good few seconds before opening them again. When I did, the door was still there, as tangible and existent as ever. This couldn't be. It just couldn't. I knew for a fact that the door was not there just a few moments before, and I'd already convinced myself that my childhood memory was nothing more than a bizarre dream. What the hell was going on? No, there was only one way to find out. After regaining some composure and mustering up a small amount of courage, I walked, however slowly, towards the inexplicable door. My unhurried movements mirrored my hesitant exterior, allowing me to stall for a moment while I gathered some nerve to actually open the damn thing. Oh, despite my slothful motion, I covered the gap in a few seconds, a testament to the basement's small size. The moment of truth was upon me. I took in a deep breath, turned the knob, and pushed the door open. This was it. I'd finally get to the bottom of my aunt's plea and my own odd memories. The door creaked and revealed the room behind it. Lo and behold, it was none other than the attic. Just as I remembered it, window and all. But how? 
The sunlight came through the window and danced across the room brilliantly, leaving me awestruck. I walked forward to look outside, to make sure that this was indeed the attic and I hadn't gone completely crazy. After peering out of the window, that verdict was still up in the air. Two stories below was my aunt's yard. The grass was green as ever and the sky was as clear as day. Everything was so vibrant. I looked over my aunt's garden and to my surprise there was a person there. It was a woman and she was gardening. Who was that, and why was she in my aunt's garden? She turned around, revealing her face. And to my surprise, it was my aunt. What? How? My aunt was dead. I watched as she was lowered into the earth. Just then I heard the sound of footsteps from behind me. Startled, I turned around to face the noise. Who are you? A soft voice asked. It was my ten-year-old self, standing just twenty feet away from me. I was in such a delirious state by this point that I decided just to go with it and converse with myself. I'm a friend, is all I could think to say. You're a friend of my aunt's? he asked innocently. I've forgotten just how curious I was as a child. Um, yes, a uh, very dear friend. My younger self walked over to look out the window where I was standing. I stepped aside and let him do so. He saw our aunt outside gardening below and waved at her. She didn't notice. Do you have an aunt? he asked. Yeah, but she passed away, I said. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Just then an epiphany struck. Maybe this was the reason I was here. Maybe this was the closure I needed all along. Listen to me, I know it's hard for you to understand right now, but someday your aunt will pass away too. I want you to spend as much time as possible with her and visit whenever you can. You mean the world to her, and you'll regret it if you don't make an effort to be with her now when you still can. Okay, is all he said. That's all he needed to say. After walking around and looking at some of the old stuff in the attic, including some of the books that caught his eye, my younger self left to venture back to the basement and shut the door behind him. I looked out the window and noticed that my aunt had finished gardening and was now walking back to the house. This was when my next epiphany struck. I was beginning to remember more of the events of that day. It was all coming back to me. I remembered me as I look now, standing in the attic, the friendly bearded man with glasses. I remember the conversation we had and even discussing it with my aunt afterward. My astonishment was interrupted by more footsteps in the next room. This time they were my aunt's. I ran over to the door and listened. You can't be down here, she yelled in a worried tone. Oh, I wanted to open the door and confront her just to see her one last time and to tell her that I'm sorry for never visiting. I reached for the knob but thought it best not to go out there. She would probably have thought that I was an intruder, lurking around her house. Well, as I said before, she wouldn't recognize me all grown up. My apology would have to go unspoken. I could hear her scolding the younger version of me and then bringing me back upstairs. Instead of listening to find out what happened next, I just remembered. I could recall telling my aunt about the attic door in the basement and the friendly bearded man. She told me I'd quite the imagination, and told me to wash up for dinner. Well, looking back now, I remember a troubled glint in her eye, especially after divulging what the bearded man had told me. She seemed to know more about my experience than she led on. I stood there for a while, taking everything in. Eventually, I decided it was time for me to leave. I grabbed the knob and jiggled it. It wouldn't bite. I turned it a little bit harder, but to no avail. A wave of terror consumed me. And this didn't make any sense. The doors in my aunt's house had no locks. Then again, nothing made sense up to this point either. I backed up a little and ran into the door. It remained still. I did this a few more times and even tried breaking the window. Nothing happened. Feeling weary, I sat down and took a breather. 
And this is when I heard a distant echo of footsteps and voices coming from within the house. It was my friend and his girlfriend. Oh, I'd almost forgotten about them. I was saved. In a relieved stupor, I called out to them. It became quickly apparent that they couldn't hear me from wherever I was. I heard them walking around, calling out my name. I increased my volume and started banging on the door. I'm in here, guys, I yelled, not knowing whether I was below or above them. They still couldn't hear me. I began to panic. I started screaming at the top of my lungs and banging as hard as I could on the attic door. I received no response. With a dead voice and pained hands, I gave up. I put my back against the wall and slid down to a sitting position. A few tears streaming down my face. I just sat there and listened as my friend and his girlfriend conversed from within the house. Where could he be? He said he'd meet us at the car, right? He's not in the house. Where the hell is he? My friend asked his girlfriend. Did you try the basement? She asked. Yeah, there's nothing but some old floorboards down there. What about the attic? She asked. Tried there too. Just filled with a bunch of old dusty antiques. I will have to call the police and have them look for him too. Must have gotten lost in the woods looking for us. As they made their way out of the cottage, my heart sank. If they'd already searched the basement and attic, then where was I? I quietly sobbed in the corner for a while before looking through some of my aunt's old things. It was all I could do at this point. I didn't care for any of it, save for one treasure of hers that caught my eye. It was a book with a blood-red symbol hand-painted on the front. I'd never seen anything like it before. I opened it up and read the beginning out loud. The spells in this book are to be followed precisely. If even one step is not executed properly, you might endanger yourself and those around you. Use these spells at your own risk. Well, the odd nature of this preface littered my nerves with a sense of worry. Was my aunt a witch? Before turning the page, I noticed an old lace bookmark saving one of the pages. I opened it and looked at the chapter heading. Chapter 8. Horticulture. I glanced over at the next page and saw a spell meant to bring your garden to life. The ritual involved lighting some candles and making a circle of some special sand I'd never heard of. From within the circle you are to recite the spell verbatim. Now my Latin was a little rusty, but from what I could read of the incantation, it said something along the lines of, Bring above that which is below, which I assume referred to the growing of plants. Well, I gathered that my aunt performed the ritual in the attic, as there were some dormant candles in with her stuff. The inclusion of this book in my aunt's collection now made sense to me. She wanted to spice up her doll garden with a bit of witchcraft. Well, I can say with some confidence that it more than likely backfired. I'm now stuck in this damn place, a place that seems to be a realm of its own. I will more than likely spend an eternity here. I'm now growing to accept my fate. She did warn me, after all. I should have listened. This is my fault and mine alone. With the endless paper and writing materials here in this old attic, I'm left to do nothing but write down in words what has happened to me, in the hopes that someone may come across it. Somehow, the words of a living ghost. If you are reading this, please listen to what I have to say. Your time here is not boundless, and at any moment the horrid hand of the unknown could come knocking at your door. There to bereave your loved ones and steal you away from your blissful, ordinary existence. The cause of this sudden upheaval will be death, or, in my case, something far worse. Last, but not least, if you are ever in the neck of the woods and feel a need to stop in and say hi, go right ahead. I can't promise you'll get a response. I just want you to remember two things. Your life is fleeting, so spend your time wiser than I did mine. And whatever you do, don't go in the basement. The Axeman's Lullaby I was just a kid. I didn't know any better. Even if I could go back, 
What would I have done differently? Could I have changed what happened? Could I have done anything at all? Probably not. Even so, I can't help but dwell on the details. Some nights it keeps me from sleeping. I can only hope that sharing my tale will help ease the burden. I don't remember much of my childhood before my mother passed away. My dad told me she was struck by a car on her way to work. I was only four years old. Still, I know that I loved her. Part of me still does. It's a strange, lingering feeling that doesn't ever go away. As much as I loved her, I feel that my father loved her even more. I say it's because my mother's death took an immense toll on him. Up until I was about ten years of age, he'd have a nervous breakdown, tears and all, at least once a month. He never told me why, but I know it was because of her. Things changed a bit in my tenth year. We moved out of that house, the one that reminded us of her. My dad pulled me out of the school system and we moved into a cabin out in the middle of nowhere. Well, it may seem a bit drastic, but it was clear that my father needed a change. He wasn't doing so well. And because of this, I didn't question his actions. And from that point on, we lived a simple life. My dad took odd jobs here and there. And seeing as we lived up north, selling firewood was sufficient enough to supplement our income. That was my job. I'd go out each morning with my dad's old axe and chop up some logs for our eager customers. It wasn't much of a life, but it was good enough for us. Comfortable with our new living situation, I was taken completely off guard one night when I heard the sound of crying coming from my father's room. We'd been doing so well, so why was he still in such dire straits? Before I could analyse the situation any further, I heard my dad get up and slam the door shut on his way out of the cabin. I was compelled to follow him. Peeking out the cabin's entrance, I saw my dad storm off into the woods, bringing with him an acoustic guitar. I'd seen the guitar before, and I knew my dad had used to play, but I'd never seen him handle the thing. I figured that those years were behind him. Curious as to what he was up to, I followed him into the forest. I tiptoed, making sure to hide behind trees and avoid stepping on leaves as I went. Eventually we came to a small clearing with a creek running through it. Near the creek was a stump where my dad sat down and adjusted himself until he was comfortable. He looked down at his old guitar, closed his eyes and began playing. I stood in awe of what I was hearing. A haunting mixture of melodious vocals and the rustling of trees in the wind filled the forest. I knew he played, but I never knew he could sing. It was breathtaking, for lack of a better word. This went on as often as my dad had had breakdowns in our previous house. Each night it happened, I'd follow my dad out to the woods and listen to the beautiful song he'd seemingly written. I didn't know what it all meant, but I could tell, even at that age, that it stemmed from a place of great pain. I could tell that the sombre, heartfelt tune was about losing a loved one. Whenever I tried to picture my mother, the image was always blurry and out of focus, almost as if what a little memory I had of her was slipping away. Whenever my dad played this song, I could picture her crystal clear. It was the oddest thing. This brought me comfort and ultimately helped me come to terms with her death. I'd hoped at the time that it was doing the same for him. Being ten years old, though, it was hard to tell what was going through an adult's mind. Many months passed. The routine was nice for a while, but one night everything changed. I heard the usual swing of the cabin door followed by a swift crack against the door frame. It was very loud, signaling to me that my father was more distressed than usual. I hastily made my way to the door in an effort to follow him, but I stopped for a moment when passing his bedroom. The door was open just enough for me to see the guitar leaning up against his bed. How peculiar. I wondered why he'd left it behind. In truth, there was only one way to find out. My dad was already at the creek when I arrived. He sat on the stump, motionless and quiet. He was in a sulking position and his eyes were closed. Without his guitar or voice, the forest around him was void of sound. The only thing I could hear was the water in the creek as it trickled by us. 
Soon enough, my father began singing. I could tell it was the same song he'd always sung, but it sounded off. Without his guitar, his voice was muddy and out of tune. There were some awkward highs and lows that made my stomach turn. Though his eyes were shut, I saw tears force their way out and watched as they swam down his cheeks. Eventually, he stopped singing and broke down crying. What happened in the following moments will stay with me forever. As my father wept, something strange happened. A milky white fog danced across the water. At first I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me, but eventually the white smoke gathered above the creek and took shape before my very eyes. It was a spirit. No ordinary spirit, mind you. It was my mother. My father stopped crying and instead began shivering. He opened his eyes and looked up to see the spectre. He almost fell backward in fear. The ghost of my mother reached out and began choking my father. His face went from red to blue before my mom stopped. He fell to the ground and vigorously gasped for air. I couldn't bring myself to lend a helping hand. I was stuck in a petrified state. My father tried to crawl away, but it was no use. My mother began clawing away at him. She tore through his clothes and eventually his skin. I watched in horror as she reached into his body and ripped out vital organs. His bones snapped like branches. His blood tainted the water. His voice once again filled the forest, only now it was screams of agony. I couldn't bear to watch any longer, so I closed my eyes. With eyes shut, I remembered the song my dad sung. I started humming it to myself, and just like that, I calmed down. The world around me became quiet. All I could think about was the song, that beautiful tune. Memories of my parents came through the floodgates as I hummed. Tears rolled down my cheeks. I couldn't help but fall apart. What had my childhood become? Where was I going to go from here? Eventually I stopped humming and opened my eyes. The apparition of my mother was gone. My dad's open corpse lay on the stump where he used to sing. As the scene before me sunk in, so did my heart. I crawled into the pit of my stomach and made a nest. It would stay there for many years to come. I don't remember running back to the cabin, nor do I recall calling the local authorities. What I do remember is the look on their faces when they took me back out there and saw what I'd seen. The sight of my father's body was a grisly one, that's for sure. It was unlike anything the town had ever witnessed. Still, it was taken care of in a swift and respectful fashion. In the coming months, the investigation came to an end. The true cause of my father's death was never determined, but that doesn't mean there were no answers to be found. My mother's body was discovered buried beneath the creek. My father's axe was determined to be the murder weapon. One of the theories floating around town was that my dad was the jealous type. I think he convinced himself my mum was having an affair and then lost his marbles. And feeling guilty, he'd moved us out near the dump site so he could be closer to her. I guess we'll never know the full story. But one thing is for certain. My mother had her revenge. So four wonderful, wonderful stories there from the incredibly talented Mr. Christopher Maxim. Um, sadly, he's not writing so much at the moment, but but he has such a wonderful back catalogue, and he's very, very kindly given me access to all of it. What a gentleman. Now, all he's asking in return is for me to um let you know that he's going through some pretty tough times at the moment. Um, the current situation has um left him in, um well, not the uh, best of circumstances, so um, I'm leaving some details in the video description below, so if by any chance you can help him out a little bit, then please follow the links and show him the kind of support that he needs right now. Okay? 
Thank you so, so much, my dear friends. Well, that is enough for me for one evening, but I will be back again very, very soon, like I always am. Till next time, very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams, and bye-bye.